Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 you will hear a woman asking for information over the phone. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon, Plainfield Community Centre. Yes, hi. I'm new in town and I was curious about the services the Community Centre has to offer. We offer a variety of recreational activities. What were you interested in in particular? Well, uh, everything, I guess. OK, let's start with kids. I have a teenage son. What activities do you have for teens? Right now, during the school year, we have tutoring sessions for children and teens in all subjects. That would be good. He needs help with algebra. We can certainly help with that. Just have him come by any Wednesday or Saturday afternoon. That's when the tutoring sessions are scheduled. Fantastic. What about sports? Do you have sports activities for teens? We have tennis lessons on Sunday mornings for teens and Sunday afternoon for adults. Hmm. I don't think my son would like that, but my husband might. For myself, I'd be more interested in yoga. Do you offer yoga classes? We do. Our yoga classes take place on Tuesday and Thursday evenings. We divide it up into several groups. So there's one class for younger children, one for teens, and one for adults. Really? I doubt my husband and son would be interested, but I'd like to sign up for yoga. I also like reading. Do you have any book clubs? We have one just about to start. The first meeting will be next Friday morning. It will focus on early 20th century novels. Too bad it's Friday morning. I think my son would enjoy it, but of course he's in school at that time. Well, actually, that book club is for adults only. We may start one up for teens next summer, but we have nothing for that age group right now. Oh, well, I suppose he has enough to keep him busy for now. Now, what about fees? Do these classes and activities cost anything? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. There's a small charge for non-members for each class. However, they're all free to members. Would you be interested in becoming a member? How much does the membership cost? Not much at all. The yearly fee is $75 for individuals and $225 for families. What do I get with the membership? You get free access to all classes and activities. And you can use our facilities like the tennis court, the exercise room and the meeting room. It's not a bad deal, really. Could you tell me exactly where the centre is located? It's at 107 Elliott Street. Is that Elliott with two L's or one L? One L. E-L-I-O-T. It's right downtown. I think I know where it is. Do you have free parking? Yes. You can park just across the street. There's a garage there. That sounds easy enough. Maybe I'll come in one day next week and sign up for some classes. That would be fine. But don't come on Monday because we're closed that day. We're open Tuesday through Sunday. Oh, thanks for telling me. Maybe I'll stop in on Tuesday then. Can I pay for the classes with a personal check? We accept checks and credit cards. OK, thank you very much. You've been very helpful.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a hike leader giving information about an upcoming hiking trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening, everyone. As you know, this is our last meeting before we set off on our annual week-long hiking trip. So tonight I'll be telling you everything you'll need to know to be ready for the trip. Let's talk about equipment first. Having the right equipment is essential for your comfort and safety. First, you'll need a warm and comfortable sleeping bag. However, you won't need to worry about carrying a tent, since we'll be sleeping in shelters along the way. Also, part of the fee you've paid for the trip goes toward food, so you won't need to put that on your packing list either. We found, though, that it's more efficient for each person to bring his or her own dishes, so be sure to pack a plastic bowl, a cup, and a fork, knife, and spoon. That's all you'll need in the way of dishes. Perhaps the most important item to put on your list is a comfortable pair of hiking boots. Nothing ruins a hike more than getting blisters and sores from ill-fitting boots. So make sure your boots fit you right. Shoes and sneakers aren't adequate for the type of hiking we'll be doing. Of course, a backpack is necessary for carrying your equipment. Make sure you have one that's lightweight and comfortable to carry. Walking poles have become popular among hikers recently, but we don't recommend them. They can get in the way when too many hikers are using them at once, and some serious injuries have been caused. So it's best to leave those at home. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh yes, some people have asked me about trail maps. They're available, but you really don't need them, as your hike leaders have scouted out the trail and will be guiding you along the way. And don't forget to bring a warm jacket. You may think you won't need one in this warm summer weather, but remember that evenings in the mountains can get quite cold. Is there anything else I need to tell you? Oh, yes, your guides will each be carrying a first aid kit, so that's one less thing for you to pack yourself. Remember, you'll be carrying your backpack all day, so keep your load light and don't overpack. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I know you're all experienced hikers, but it's always worth repeating the rules of the trail since they're so important. These rules are in place for the safety of everyone on the trip. As you know, there'll be a hike leader walking at the head of the line who will show the group the way. At the end of the line will be the rear leader, or sweep. It's important to always stay ahead of this person while we're on the trail. There are several different trails on the mountain where we'll be hiking, and they cross each other at some points. When you come to any intersection of trails, stop and wait for the rest of the group to catch up. 
This way we can be sure that no one goes off on the wrong trail. Let me emphasize here how important it is to stay on the trail. We'll be climbing through some steep and rocky areas. Don't be tempted to go off on your own and try to climb some rocks. That can be quite dangerous. Also, it's not likely, but it is possible that we'll encounter some large wild animals along the way. The last thing you want to do is try to feed any of them. That will just encourage them to follow us, which could lead to some dangerous situations. One last thing before we set off hiking each morning. Be sure to fill up your water bottle. This is perhaps the most important safety rule. Dehydration can be a serious problem when you're out in the wilderness, so you must always be sure to carry an adequate supply of water with you. I think that covers just about everything. Uh, are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a university student and a faculty advisor about the requirements for the student teaching semester. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions 21 to 24. I'd like to go over with you today some of the requirements for your student teaching, which you'll be undertaking next semester. I'm really looking forward to working in a real classroom and teaching children, but I'm nervous about it too. One of my roles is to provide you with whatever support you may require. One thing that helps me do that is to know what you're doing in the classroom. So I require all my students to keep a journal about their teaching experience. That sounds like a lot of work. Will I have to write in it every day? Yes, if you can. You'll give it to me at the end of each week. Another thing I want from you is a few sample lesson plans. I'll let you know ahead of time exactly how I want you to do them. Several of us from the university will be student teaching at the same school. Are we supposed to get together regularly to discuss our work? I'll meet with each student teacher individually, but you aren't required to meet with each other. Of course, you can talk together as much as you want. You will, however, have to observe some of the other teachers in the school, besides the teacher you'll be working with. Then will I get an evaluation from my supervising teacher at the end of the semester? Actually, no. I'll do your evaluation, and I'll base it on several things. One is your required portfolio, which you contain samples of your class activities and your students' work. Another important thing is your term paper. Then there won't be a final exam? No, we don't feel that's necessary for student teaching. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I know I have to get an agreement form signed. Since you're my advisor, are you the one to do that? Uh, no, that form is for your supervising teacher to sign, to document that he or she agrees to have you in the classroom as a student teacher. Oh, I see. I'm concerned about the term paper I'll have to do and the evaluation process. 
I'm not sure I understand what I'm supposed to do. Regarding the term paper, the first thing is to choose a topic. It should be related to your teaching work. You should let me know your term paper topic by the end of the first week of the semester. Will you be observing me regularly in the classroom? Yes, and during the fourth week of the semester, we'll have our first evaluation meeting to discuss my observations. One thing I'm really looking forward to is the student teacher conference that the university puts on every year. I'm glad you're looking forward to it. Of course, everyone in the program is required to attend. The conference takes place. Let me check. Yes, the seventh week of the semester. When will I have to turn in my term paper? The term paper is due by the end of the fourteenth week of the semester. Then, during the fifteenth and final week, we'll get together one last time for a semester review. Wow, it looks like I have a busy semester ahead of me. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about customer psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Now listen carefully, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. An understanding of customer psychology is an invaluable aid for retailers looking for ways to increase sales. Much can be done to the store environment to encourage shoppers to linger longer and spend more money. The first aspect to consider is the physical organisation of the store. Placement of merchandise has a great deal of influence on what customers buy. For example. A common practice among retailers is to place the store's best-selling merchandise near the back of the store. In order to get to these popular items from the front entrance, customers have to walk down aisles filled with merchandise that they might not see otherwise. Carpets are also used to direct customers through particular areas of the store. Retailers choose carpets not only for their decorative or comfort value. But also because lines or other types of patterns in the carpets can subtly guide shoppers in certain directions. Besides encouraging shoppers to go to certain areas of the store, retailers also want to keep them in the store longer. One way to do this is to provide comfortable seating throughout the store, but not too close to the doors. This gives customers a chance to rest and then continue shopping. Retailers can do a number of things to create a pleasant atmosphere in the store, thereby encouraging more purchases. Music is commonly used not as entertainment but as a calming influence. It can slow the customer's pace through the store, making them spend more time shopping and, consequently, making more purchases. Scents are also used in various ways. Everyone has had the experience of being drawn into a bakery by the smell of fresh bread. Experiments have been done with other types of scents as well. For example, the scent of vanilla has been used to increase sales in clothing stores. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions thirty-six to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-six to forty. 
Use of colour is another important aspect of store environment. Certain colours can affect behaviour as well as mood. Light purple, for example, has been found to have an interesting effect on customer behaviour. People shopping in an environment where light purple is the predominating colour seem to spend money more than shoppers in other environments. Orange is a colour that's often used in fast food restaurants. It encourages customers to leave faster, making room for the next group of diners. Blue, on the other hand, is a calming colour. It gives customers a sense of security, so it's a good colour for any business to use. In addition to using colour to create mood and affect customer behaviour, colour can also be used to attract certain kinds of customers to a business. Stores that cater to a younger clientele should use bold, bright colours, which tend to be attractive to younger people. Stores that are interested in attracting an older clientele will have more success with soft, subtle colours, as older people find these colours more appealing. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.